that's the extent of structural geology in Professor Foster. Um, so now we're going to move into, you know, eventually quantifying more mathematically stress, okay? But over the course of this class, we're going to use a lot of matrix algebra. Right? Um, in some ways, the, the, the stress tensor can be thought of as a three by three matrix. Most of the time when you operate on the stress tensor, you can just think of it as a three by three matrix. And so we're gonna do a lot of matrix manipulations, matrix algebra in this class. Ultimately, we're gonna do 99% of that on a computer because computers are very good at doing that kind of stuff. Right? But so that you can have some appreciation for what the computer is doing for you, I'm gonna teach you a little bit of linear algebra. So has anyone here had a course in linear algebra? One person. So this will be boring to you. And I realize, and that's why I choose to take a little bit of time. It, it, it'll be no more than, you know, take, take no more than an hour uh, total on linear algebra. Um, primarily what we, we need the tools in linear algebra to build up to, to do is to solve eigenvalue problems. Who knows what an eigenvalue is? Few of you. Where do where do eigenvalues appear in engineering science? Like, can you give me a problem or why why you care about eigenvalues? So in, in the context of this class, it turns out that uh, the eigenvalues of the stress tensor, that three by three matrix that we'll learn about, are the principal stresses, and the principal stresses in the Earth are most easily identified, and that will be what we can actually measure uh, in the field. And so it's useful to work or to work on things associated with the principal stresses. But the eigenval eigenvalues appear in all types of engineering science. Um, how many of you have ever driven your car down the road when your tires were severely out of balance? And all of a sudden, you know, if you're driving 50, you're, you're shaking like hell. But if you slow down to 40, it kind of goes away, right? Or even sometimes if you speed up to 80, it goes away. Right? Has everybody, anyone ever experienced that? None of you drive 80? So that, that, that shaking you're feeling at that particular speed, right, uh, is the resonant frequency of the, the, the entire automobile system associated with it. And it's, it's pretty amazing that you can just go in and put some little weights on your tire and you make that go away, right? Um, but the reason we can do that and we know is specifically where to put those weights is because we understand the vibrations. And so it turns out, uh, essentially if you, actually my first job was at Discount Tire Company when I was 16. I used to hammer those little weights on. We had this machine. And what that machine is doing is actually internally computing eigenvalues of the tire assembly uh, determining what the resonant frequency of the tire is. And so when you're driving along and your tires are out of balance and you, and you feel that shaking, that's the resonant frequency of the system. And mathematically, that resonant frequency is can be determined by an eigenvalue problem. And so that little tire balance machine you see at Discount Tire and other tire stores is actually utilizing that information to determine where to put the weights on the tire to make that go away, put your tire in balance. So that's just one example. There, there are many, many other uh, examples in engineering where eigenvalues are, are important. Okay. So ultimately, we're working up to kind of two things, or two things we care about in linear algebra in the context of this class. Eigenvalue problems and the solution of linear systems of equations, particularly on a computer. So, uh, and again, you know, this is this is sort of very very simple, uh, but we got to start here. So those of you that know some of this, you, you might be bored, but understand we're working up to eigenvalue problems. So if I have if I have a vector C, we normally write this in vector notation. Vector C, a matrix A, and a vector B. I want to do a matrix vector dot product, essentially, 
the way I compute the components of C, and I, I like to remember it like this. I like to use just say it in words. So, so C1, the first component of C, is the first row of A dot product B, right? The second component of C is the second row of A dot product B. You all know what a dot product is, right? And you know, finally, the third component of C is the first and um, third row of A dot product B. And so there's what it is written out for each component. Everybody okay? Matrix vector dot product. So I figured you probably know that. So in words, the CI, right? So I be the ith component of the C vector. The C CI is the dot product of the ith row of A with B. So you probably all know that, but but what you may not know is you know, how to do matrix matrix multiplication. So in matrix matrix multiplication, again, I like to use words. So the C11 component of C, right? So then now we have three matrices, right? So this is a matrix C, a matrix A, and a matrix B. So the C11 component is the first row of A dot product, first column of B. The C12 is the first row of A, second column of B. C13 is the first row of A, third column of B. And these go on like that. So essentially, you can look at the lowercase indices and tell you know, this is associated with the row of A. And the, the first one is the row of A, and the second one is the column of B. Right? So for example, to jump out of order, you know, the, the C32 is going to be the third row of A with the second column of B, right? dot product. So there's a couple examples written out, dot products, in, you know, in word, in words, the IJ, where IJ is the component, the C matrix, the CIJ is the dot product of the ith row of A with the jth column of B. So, well, I was going to work that out, but there's the answer. <laughs> I meant to hold off on that. Um, yeah, so again, we take the first row here, 2, 1, take the dot product with 1, 2, right? So that's going to be 2 times 1, which is 2, plus 1 times 2, which is 4. Right? Same thing, uh, 3 times 1, which is 3, plus 2 times 2, which is 4. 4 plus 3 is 7. So we'll go ahead and look at a matrix. We have a matrix 2, 1, 3, 2. And we multiply another matrix 1, 3, 1, 2. And, and I'm just going to write it out very explicitly here. Go slow. So our, our result will also be a matrix. 
I've, I've put the little dash lines in there to just separate the, the locations, the entries in the matrix, right? So we have, for the first, the 1-1 one, one entry, we have the first row of A, right? this is A, this is B. We have the first row of A with the first column of B, right? So that's 2 times 1 plus 1 times 1, right? And then for the 1-2, we have the first row of A times the second column of B. So that's 2 times 3 plus 1 times 2. And then we continue, right? 3, 1, plus 2, 1, 3. Three plus two, two, and so then if we just work out the the math, you get three eight five thirteen. So that's the second example. So another useful thing. Uh, in linear algebra is to take the determinant of the matrix. So who can who knows the formula for a determinant of the matrix? Hmm? A D minus B C, right? So you can memorize that formula if you want. A D minus B C. I like to just kind of think of it graphically, right? So I just make an X, right? So it's A D minus B C. That's how I remember it. Just make an X. And the reason that helps me is because when you go to higher, ma bigger matrices, you can sort of also do it graphically. So for a three by three matrix, I mean, you can memorize the formula if you want. There it is. I think it would be pretty hard for me to, to memorize that. But what I do is, again, just I, I start with, I start with A, start with A, and then I cross out the row and column, and then I take the determinant of what's left over. Just use X, EI minus FH. Right? So that's that formula. Okay. And then there is, the thing you do have to remember is there's a minus sign, so they'll always alternate plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And this generalizes to very large matrices. Um, so then for the second one then, I'm going to take B, I'm going to cross out the row and column, and then take the determinant of what's left. Right? So D times I minus F times H, that's what you have there. For C, I'm going to cross out the row and column and take the determinant of what's left. D times H minus E times G. So then all you have to remember is just that it's going to go plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And that, that generalizes if I had a bigger matrix, like if I had a 4 by 4, I wouldn't recommend ever taking a determinant of anything bigger than a 3 by 3 by hand to use the computer, but you, you could do the same thing, right? So for a 4 by 4, you're going to take this guy times the cross of the row and column out and then figure out what the determinant of that guy is, right? Well, the determinant of that guy, then you do this again, right? And then you'd go same thing, right? You, now you'd have a minus sign, uh, oops, and, and then compute the determinant of that 3 by 3. Then you'd have a plus sign and compute the determinant of that 3 by 3. And this goes on and on. Again, uh, I would never take the determinant of anything bigger than a 3 by 3 by hand. Use a computer. The computer doesn't actually implement this rule like I showed. That, that's a better way to do it in a computer. So one, one thing that's useful, or what can we use determinants for? Uh, you know, when we solve linear systems of equations, we, we often solve a system of equation that has the form, you know, we're looking for, uh, we're looking for the solution 
x for a matrix A times a vector x equal to a vector B. Right? Ax equal to B. This is what we're, you know, if, you, if you've taken, well, I guess only a couple of you took res 3 from me, but so far, but if you take res 3, I mean, this is all we do all class. Solve big matrix equations of this form. Right? And so we're solving, we're looking for x in this way. And so the way you do this is you multiply, and it matters when you're doing matrices. Like, so if you're multiplying scalars, it doesn't matter if you multiply on the left side of a, or the right side of an equation. Right? If I just multiply that equation by 2, I could say 2ax, or I could say ax2. It doesn't matter. But with matrices, it does matter on which side of the equation you multiply. But if I multiply then both sides of the equation by a inverse, any matrix times its inverse is the identity matrix. And any and the identity matrix times any vector is just the vector. So that's the solution to that equation. It's just the thing is, A inverse is not guaranteed to exist. Every made, you know, just because a matrix is this it doesn't mean its inverse will. And one way we can quickly determine. So if a matrix inverse does not exist, it's, it's said to be singular. And one way we can quickly determine if a matrix is going to be singular before we attempt to take the inverse, which is an expensive operation in a computer, is to compute the determinant. If the determinant is what, the matrix is singular. Do I know? If the determinant equals zero, so a matrix is singular if its determinant is zero. So in other words, if a determinant of a matrix is zero, it doesn't have an inverse. And therefore, this system of equations doesn't have a solution. Okay? I think that's a good place to stop for today.